To those of you who have been at AHI webinars previously, welcome back. Uh, this is the third in a series when uh, COVID hit. Uh, we started thinking about other ways to engage with our friends and family and colleagues around the world. Um, and one of the things that AHI really values is the discussions that can come out of that engagement. And so we wanted to create a webinar series that talked about the issues of our time around housing, uh, also solutions that we are thinking of or thinking about, um, and give an opportunity for discussion on those topics. So this may be a little bit different than other webinars you've attended where there's mostly presentation and then a little bit of Q&A through the chat or otherwise at the end. We really do want it to be an open discussion. Um, we have uh, Elizabeth Bigham with us here today to give our headline presentation and Matt Hoffman, uh, who is our lead for the health secure housing work within AHI uh, to give some response. Elizabeth is a senior at Williams College and we were fortunate enough to have uh, her undivided attention all summer before she had to go back to school. Um, at least I assume it was undivided. But anyway, she did great work with us this summer as an intern uh, looking at dimensions of health secure housing, which is a business line that we started developing and thinking about uh, in March, April, soon after COVID hit and Matt has been spearheading much of that work. Um, so Elizabeth took her own spin on it and uh, went down many rabbit holes looking at how public space and health security intersect and particularly how they intersect with senior populations and senior populations in affordable housing. But I will leave it to Elizabeth to do the real talking here. Um, if everyone could stay on mute for now, that would be helpful for audio purposes. Um, if you're having any bandwidth issues, feel free to turn off your camera when we come to the discussion. It's always great to see everyone's faces. So if you do have the bandwidth to run video, uh, please do so at that point and I'll, I'll open it back up. Uh, Elizabeth has about a 20 minute presentation and then Matt will make a few comments and they'll have a little bit of discussion and then we'll open it up to everyone. If you have thoughts along the way, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll come back to those comments and make sure uh, either we call on you to speak or they get highlighted later on in the hour. Um, so with that and no further ado, Elizabeth, take it away. Cool, let me share my screen. All right, can everyone see? Awesome, okay. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Bigham. I am a senior at Williams College, and this summer, while I was interning at AHI, I did research on promoting affordable health secure senior housing through the utilization of outdoor assets, which sounds like a very complicated title, but obviously I'm gonna go more into it. So, um, for some background on my research, First, um, health in its medical, but also public health sense is in the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, second, we know that stay at home orders are impossible if there's no home to go to or an unhealthy one. Um, and this was seen with the rate at which homeless individuals were contracting um, COVID-19 in places like Boston or Los Angeles. Um, another thing that we do know is that seniors are particularly at risk of um, dying from COVID-19. Um, something else that has been discovered through some research is that COVID-19 transmission tends to be lower outside and that's partially um, due to the fact that there's more airflow outside. Um, we also do know that the outdoors already have a number of benefits, health benefits, um, both physical, mental, um, and combining these last two factors, we know that outdoor space can combat the negative health impacts of COVID-19 in three frontiers. Um, first, in the realm of social isolation, where you can have um, distance gatherings and the like with masks, obviously, and the whatnot. Um, the outdoors can prevent physical stagnation. So, for example, a lot of folks were getting outside to go on walks or hikes um, throughout the pandemic. Um, and finally, mental fatigue. Going outside can provide a new environment um, with, you know, air and sunlight and the like. Um, and the outdoors, outdoor spaces can be great for combating that. Um, 
So my process in my research, so first I define types of space. You'll see that in the next slide. And then I broke that space down into a number of assets. So key components that could be used to create um, health secure housing. And then finally, I asked the question, how can you utilize these assets to create health secure housing? Um, not only with the benefits as these assets currently are, but also their potential to create even better health secure housing. Um, so the first thing I did was define space. Um, you'll notice there are four different types of space ranging from public to private. I didn't really go into public as much um, only because you don't tend to find that as much in the affordable housing that I was studying at the very least. Um, and this Venn diagram concept was actually created by a Turkish researcher in the 90s, um, noting that there can be gray areas between types of space. And while I didn't exactly go into that, um, that's definitely something that can be done in the future. Um, so I define semi-public space as a space that maintains public field, um, but is slightly more restrictive, mainly in that it is defined by insider and outsider groups. So for example, an insider group would be the affordable housing residents that live very close to this space, whereas outsider groups might be community members that have to trek in somehow. Um, and then going down from there, you have semi-private space, which is not publicly accessible. That's the main difference. Um, it is limited to all or a selected pool of residents and their chosen guests, whereas private space is limited to the residents of a single dwelling and their chosen guests. Um, and something that I also looked at a little bit is how all these different spaces are in urban space, because as you can imagine, there's a difference between like a pocket park in a major city versus like a pocket park in a more rural town. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I wanted to acknowledge the fact that urban space can have these, um, these differences that should be worth noting. Um, so first I talked about semi-public space. So the four assets that I focused on are um, semi-public spaces are good community gathering space. They are high, um, highly accessible. They tend to be large in size and they have something called ventilation and circulation, which I defined as the movement of people, sunlight and air. Um, so basically, with a larger space, you can have lots of airflow, you have more access to light if it's not blocked by buildings on all four sides, um, and you tend to have people flow more through these types of spaces. Um, so some of the similarities between these assets, first and probably one of the most important points I'll make is that they reinforce public health commitments within communities. So I'm going to talk about this throughout the presentation, and mainly what I mean by that is that um, research suggests that when you get to know your neighbor, you establish a stake in their health. So for example, um, if I became really good friends with my next door neighbor back at home and started to notice that they weren't, weren't really going outside or I wasn't seeing them as much, um, because we had established that bond, I'd be more likely to check in on them. Um, and this is actually something that's been super important throughout the pandemic is neighbor check-ins and the like. Um, so this is a really important, um, this is a really important factor of semi-public space that you can capitalize on. Um, second, it creates a sense of belonging for both residents and outside community members. For seniors in particular, um, research suggests that being a part of something bigger than themselves can be mentally beneficial, um, and semi-public spaces have the capacity, both in terms of space and in terms of flow of people to do so. Um, next, it allows members of the public to out access outdoor spaces that they might not otherwise have access to, which does things like increase inclusion. Um, and I noted that this was particularly relevant in a uh, community called Greenbridge, which is up in Washington near Seattle. It was former World War II housing. Um, and in their redevelopment, they designed a lot of pocket parks that are really highly accessible to like the public schools nearby and the community centers nearby. Um, which is super beneficial, especially because the residents who are outside of this community um, tend to be pretty park poor based on some basic mapping analysis. Um, so this type of park can really provide a space where residents who may not get to reap the benefits of it can do so. Um, next, uh, semi-public spaces can create cognitively stimulating environments. Basically, the gist of that is that you know, you can go outside into a large space. Like I talked about earlier, it can help prevent mental fatigue. Um, you can also subdivide um, semi-public space because, because it is very large and you can put different types of recreational equipment or like quiet areas in it, which I'll talk more about later. 
And then finally, you have the added benefits of ventilation and circulation. So again, the movement of people, sunlight and air, um, because the space is big and often not blocked off, you can move things through it more easily. Um, and then some suggested retrofit and redesign that I looked at based on my research. For medical, um, one of the big things that I talked about was being able to screen people for COVID. And normally that is logistically very difficult before you enter something like a park, um, which stresses the importance of having community testing centers. Um, and beyond this, obviously you want to normalize sanitation. In terms of physical retrofit, um, I talked about opening outdoor space, which kind of sounds confusing, but basically um, you're more likely to have better airflow if you don't have a space blocked on all four sides. Like for example, in a court courtyard surrounded by really tall buildings, you tend to get less airflow. So if you can open that up by designing spaces that have maybe two walls instead of four, um, you'll get better airflow. In terms of operational, um, free to use or broadband and things like Zoom are super important if you can't community build in person. Um, in terms of informational, you want clear and posted signs about limitations in use, but also signs that what I call make movement fun. Um, so for example, to simulate physical activity, um, you can have a sign that says dance from this sidewalk to this sidewalk, um, which can encourage movement and also bring some joy into people's lives more generally. Um, and then economic, this is going to be a line kind of consistent throughout my entire presentation. But the added health benefits of retrofitting and redesigning a space to make it health secure may reduce the need for costly health intervention in the future. So basically, by making a space, a built environment healthier, you reduce the potential negative um, health impacts, again, of that built environment, but also more generally. Um, next, I talked about semi-private space. Um, you'll notice I separated this into two categories, multi-generational and senior. Um, I didn't do that for semi-public because inherently they are multi-generational because you're, lots of people are using the space. Um, so the main difference I found between these two spaces was that um, with multi-generational housing, you have to build um, well-designed multi-function space. So um, features that are going to serve everyone so you can employ things like universal design, whereas with senior housing, um, you can design to more senior specific needs, so to say. Um, so some similarities between assets. First, um, research suggests that seniors prefer a division of space, and this has a lot to do with the perception of quietness. Um, so a University of Michigan study noted that um, quiet spaces are more likely to be perceived as healthier among seniors. And this is actually really important, even if it isn't just a perception, um, because if seniors assume that is a space that is going to benefit their health, they are more likely to use it and thus reap the benefits of it. Um, second, semi-private space encourages community building either within the seniors who are um, allowed in that space or within that same multi-generational community. And again, this provides a sense of purpose. Um, and also some mental stimulation in that sense. Next, um, space can be either designed universally or with seniors in mind. Obviously, this depends on your age range, physical ability, et cetera. But if you have just seniors um, living in your affordable housing community, you can design very tailored to them. And then finally, um, in this same University of Michigan study, and this is actually a very important point, the more proximate the space, the better. Um, so basically what that means is that this study from the University of Michigan noted that when seniors could see their living space from this outdoor setting, they were more likely to use it, um, especially because seniors tend to assess risk more often um, and the outdoors can be seen as a risky environment. This is a super important point. So if you want your residents to go outside and utilize the space, you have to make it proximate and you have to make it visible to their um, unit. So I talked about my research about this place called Armstrong Place, which is in uh, San Francisco, California. And they actually did a really good job at incorporating um, these four kind of similarities between assets. So you'll notice on the right, the kind of orange and um, brown building, that is actually senior specific living, but it's highly tangential to the multi-generational living. So you, they were kind of able to reap the benefits of both. Seniors had their um, quiet proximate space, and they could still go into these more active multi-generational spaces. Um, something else that I looked at is the ability to close off space. As we've seen in the news, um, 
seniors have often been sealed into their residences and that has had some pretty negative impacts on their mental well-being and physical well-being. Um, so I wanted to take a look at that because I noted that you can't, if you close an outdoor space, it really doesn't help anyone. Um, so long story short, that's actually a really bad idea in multi-generational housing. You have a wide variety of uh, needs that need to be considered. Um, and certain residents may have to enter a more public sphere. And so I talked about in my research, assigning space. Um, so certain residents who are going out into the public realm can still have outdoor space, whereas people who are doing much less of that um, can have another separate space where COVID is less likely to be transmitted between the two, so to say. Um, senior housing, it is a little bit more easy to seal off residents, as we have seen. That's what a lot of people are, that's what like nursing homes have been doing thus far um, because they are less likely to be employed and, you know, members of the public tend to come in rather than them coming out. That's just the, anyways. Um, so, but you still have the concern of social isolation. And so something that I suggest is you build community within the senior living. Um, so allow them to go into like the courtyard or the green space that is around um, and couple with that, which is really important. You have to limit staff interaction as much as much as possible. And this is where things like technological monitoring can come in. Um, so some of the suggested retrofit for semi private space. First, you have to normalize sanitation. Um, you need mask wearing and social distancing. Um, physical. I talked about adding features that increase the perception of the healthiness of a space. Again, even if it is just a perception, obviously it has to be coupled with like real health benefits, um, but perceived decrease of risk will help seniors go outside and utilize the space and reap the benefits of it. Um, operational, you really have to limit staff as much as possible and tech monitoring can be replaced um, as such. With informational, you need um, signage to denote the separation of space. And then again, economic is along the same lines. Um, healthier spaces may reduce the need for costly health intervention. And finally, I talk about private space, which I included exterior private patios, balconies, stoops, and large windows. Um, so some similarities between these assets. One, they can either provide outdoor privacy um, slash like separation from the world or they can promote social interaction from a safe distance. And so this is actually really notable with um, some of like the balcony communities that were being formed throughout like the early onset of the pandemic. So they could either be used for like neighbor check-ins or as you can see on the right, this resident enclosed their balcony using bamboo, which is actually a very smart, smart feature of this, um, of this particular balcony because greenery often blocks things like noise. Um, so you can have a wide variety of social interaction from a safe distance from it, which is really key. Um, next, health benefits of personal space. Um, research suggests that having a space of one's own can provide not only mental relief um, and a sense of ownership, but also if the resident doesn't feel comfortable going out into the world and doing physical exercise, it provides some sort of space to do so. Um, next, private space can really be beneficial to personal health security. Um, so mainly what I mean by that is residents can increase their security bubble by like saying you can't come in or allowing certain people that they know might be negative um, to come into their space. But, you know, the resident themselves can choose who is entering that space. They have complete control over it. Um, and then finally, private space, even though it is small, it can still provide fresh air, sunlight, and views of nature, all of which associated with positive health benefits. Um, so some suggested retrofit and redesign. Um, mainly what I talk about in regards to this is that um, owner operators should be able to tailor the space to what the resident wants. So for example, if they want a highly social space, they should be able to remove a curtain if it is up or say on the converse, if they want it more private, they should be able to put up a curtain, right? Um, and then obviously with informational, you, got, you have to inform guests of any change in um, visitor policies. And then again, with economic, um, the positive benefits associated with being able to go outside into these types of space may reduce the need for costly medical intervention, mainly in this case created by physical stagnation and social isolation. 
Um, and then I did a little bit of research on how this all relates to urban space. Um, and mainly what I found is that all of these, this need for like, for healthy building and retrofit and redesign is only amplified in urban space. Um, urban areas that are low income already um, tend to lack green space and outdoor space, and this is an equity issue. Um, and a lot of times these, these rentals in these types of environments have very few amenities to begin with. And coupled with that, low income communities are already at risk for negative health outcomes and are already typically excluded in public space. And like I said before, all of this means that there is a huge need for in-house green and outdoor space. Mainly um, owner operators should really seriously consider developing um, even just a semi-private space for their residents to enjoy that space because of these factors that already exist. Um, there's also the problem of limited space in urban settings, which I looked a little bit at. So one of the solutions I talked about was using the nooks and crannies. So for example, at one property I looked at, they had a rooftop garden, that's the picture you see here. And with another, um, they kind of used part of their fifth and 15th floors. They didn't completely, it, it was kind of like small, um, small little nooks of like pocket green space. And even those residents can go outside and use them and can still have fresh air and sunlight and that sort of thing. Um, I also looked at some limitations of analysis. So two things that I looked at include weather and then also um, exclusion in outdoor spaces. But first with weather, um, one thing that I noted is that seniors are already particularly um, at, like sensitive to weather and temperature and the like. And so one of the um, case studies I looked at in Denver, Colorado had a covered, they say play area, but it also had seating and the like um, that would let air in, but also prevent the space from getting too cold in the winter. And so you can have adaptations and retrofit like that. Um, and overall you can do things like increase shade, um, trees will actually absorb heat and so you can have cooler spaces especially if you're in a really hot climate and then also things like covered walkways um indoor pools obviously there's a huge issue with covid and that right now but um trying to do temperature temperature control can um encourage seniors to go outside even if the weather tends to be a little bit more extreme and then finally, like I mentioned before, um, outdoor and green spaces are historically exclusionary and limited in who they design for. Um, and some of the solutions I talk about for this is um, you want to create space that is designed for your intended user group. So for example, if you have seniors living in your affordable housing complex, you want to design for them. And this really emphasizes the need of surveying. You want to find out what your residents want and need and sending out surveys are the best way to do this. Um, some other potential solutions to this is increasing independent navigation and wayfinding, um, which can not only um, encourage mental, um, mental stimulation, but also will give them a way to kind of traverse through their space and make it their own, um, utilize tech, and then finally overall, you want to retrofit and redesign to address the fears that your residents have. Again, again hence the need for surveying. Um, and then some future research that I think could be very interesting. So I defined outdoor spaces very broadly. Um, you can have like a jungle gym or you can have a green space. Um, and I think it could be very interesting to look specifically at green spaces and how the presence of greenery can be used to promote health secure housing through, you know, increase, you know, there's research that suggests that just looking at like a plant or a garden um, can have some mental health benefits and the like. Um, I also wanted to touch on passageways, which I defined as things like sidewalks, stairs, and elevators, just because that's when people are passing one another and sometimes you can't be six feet apart on a sidewalk. And I think that could be an interesting area of research. And then finally, um, there are different types of senior affordable housing typologies. So for example, um, you might have a village set up where it's very easy to denote a green space to that set of homes. Whereas in an urban setting, you have an apartment complex, it's really difficult to assign very cleanly whose space is what if you decide, if you decide to subdivide the space. Um, so overall, that is my research. I 
I was super excited to work with AHI this summer. Um, and I look forward to seeing what else they do in terms of health secure housing. I think it should be very exciting. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was fantastic. Uh, fantastic summary of the work that you did this summer. I should, I should also mention that um, our prompt at the beginning of the summer for both Elizabeth and Andrea, who will be speaking next week, our other intern, uh, was essentially that we had this concept of health secure housing, that we were developing it, that it is inherently multidimensional uh, and to find dimensions that were interesting to them individually, as well as useful to AHI. And I think Elizabeth, you did a fantastic job of doing that and bringing in a lot of different elements based on you know, previous work you've done in, in your studies at, at Williams. So Matt, I'll, I'll leave it to you to ask some questions or add some commentary and, and build out the conversation. Great, thank you, Anya, and thank you, Elizabeth. That was a, not only a, an excellent presentation, but the research that you've done over the last several months was um, incredibly productive and sophisticated. Um, and I'll echo um, Anya in saying that it, it's uh, an emerging topic with um, not a tremendous amount of definition, and you did a great job of giving us some boundaries um, and then getting very specific on some pathways for us to pursue. So. Thank you for all that, that hard work. Um, I'm only gonna talk very briefly, and as I do that, I hope people are thinking of some questions uh, that they may wanna ask Elizabeth uh, or the general audience, um, which we'll, we'll turn to very shortly. I'm just gonna make some, some brief observations. Uh, and to level set a little bit, um, so first I've been working with um, AHI for the past six months or so, specifically on what we're calling health secure housing. Um, and this, um, the emergence of COVID in, in March really exposed for those of us working in the affordable housing field for quite some time, a new element um, that we had to address, uh, a new challenge that added to the, the litany of um, uh, criteria that makes affordable housing such a, such a difficult social problem for us to solve and that we've been pursuing for, for, in, for decades in, in the contemporary context of uh, figuring out what is fair in the context of our capitalist-driven society um, of how to help people have a home uh, and what resources they can and should have access to uh, and who's going to pay for that. Um, so traditionally, uh, the thinking has really focused on providing the structure, safe, secure housing, um, and we've done that both on the supply side by paying for the construction of buildings that the private market provides to people who can pay and or giving people who have lower incomes um, subsidies that they can pay either to a private or a public or semi-public um, nonprofit uh, landlord. Um, about 15 years ago or so, the industry started thinking about sustainability um, and the effect of climate change and how to make greener spaces. And that has migrated um, to this notion of how we make healthier spaces. Uh, up until COVID, our focus on health as an as a affordable housing sector, um, largely focused on building healthy, using healthy uh, materials inside uh, buildings and, and healthier methodologies to prevent the spread of um, uh, different types of contaminants that could exist during both the construction process and the operating process. So building healthy and operating healthy and the health care and wellness component um, has been something that is on been on the radar, but um, been difficult to figure out primarily because of a funding uh, source to pay for that. Um, and then also the way that we have our healthcare system set up in this country um, and the um, the privacy laws, especially that are in place um, uh, for good reason, but makes it a challenge to um, address um, health and wellness through through housing. Um, COVID basically has changed all that because of the deadly nature of this virus and what many of us expect to be future viruses and exposing the fragility of the system that we've built. Um, so Elizabeth's work on, on how we uh, think about the outdoors as part of housing um, is, is so important because it just hasn't been front and center, but clearly it is one of the important components to responding to not just COVID, but future um, 
contagions that we, we potentially could face. I want to start specifically referencing your work, Elizabeth, um, with regard to how the framing of the, the spaces from, from fully public to private. Um, and um, uh, I think what, what, when I saw that and reflect on that, the thing that I think is going to be very difficult for us to, to navigate or a challenge that we need to address for sure is how we do um, permissioning and enforcement in, in those two semi spaces, the semi public and the semi private. Um, it, it, that continuum makes total sense. It's, it's functional, it's reality, it's how, how we live. We, most of us don't recognize those four spaces, especially the two in the middle, the semis. Um, but especially when we're living in, in um, multifamily environments, which many seniors uh, do, and this is what this work mostly reflects, how we uh, inform people what's allowed and not allowed and then how that gets enforced, I think is gonna be, um, be, be difficult, um, but certainly overcomable, but something that we need to, to think very carefully about because it goes to a second point that you made, which is that we, we all have a stake in each other's health, especially when we're living proximate um, to, for those that we live proximate to. Um, so we're, we're building trust uh, we're recognizing that your health living next door to me could potentially affect mine, but we still want to retain some level of privacy. So how we navigate that, um, that providing support for others, um, establishing rules of the road or codes of conduct, and then figuring out who is enforcing those. So if you see someone uh, on a one-way hallway going the wrong way, I and mean, we've all probably experienced this at the grocery store, do you say something or don't you say something? Do you want to engage or do you not want to engage? Uh, and certainly when you're living with each other um, and, and these are repetitive behaviors, it's, it's kind of more threatening maybe than in a grocery store. Um, but how, how those new social interactions emerge uh, will be, be interesting to see. Um, the second thing um, that uh, I wanted to reflect on was how traditionally outdoor spaces uh, in multifamily housing have largely been considered an amenity um, and, and, and only something that can be accommodated where you have essentially enough land to build a building and you may be actually required because of the zoning to provide the, 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 the green space. But in urban environments, um, you know, it's very difficult uh, for uh, a multifamily uh, developer who's building a new building, obviously, to, to, to create traditional outdoor spaces uh, in terms of ground level outdoor spaces, but even incorporating a rooftop garden or something in the middle of the building, um, uh, those are, uh, the, the challenge there becomes, you know, who pays for that? Because that's essentially lost revenue. Any space that's vertical is space that could be uh, an apartment that, that generates revenue to pay for that. So, um, so in terms of these outdoor spaces and even ones at the ground level, they have to be, they have operating budgets. Uh, if it's grass, it needs to be mowed. If it's pavement, it needs to be swept and repaired and shoveled. Uh, if it's equipment, uh, you know, there needs to be insurance, additional insurance for, for playground equipment for sure. Um, if it's signage, you know, it needs to be repaired, uh, et cetera. So where those budgets come from uh, is something we need to, to explore further. Um, I'd also like to just mention um, uh, that when I think about the importance of the outdoors that you've presented and, and convinced me um, uh, that this is something that's important, especially for senior, senior housing, uh, I immediately thought about how it gets incorporated into public policy. So historically, um, most uh, municipalities who control zoning have parking space requirements if you're building a new building. Um, and often that's two spaces per unit. Um, so um, it made me think about in the future, will we require or should we require um, some access to outdoor space, whether it's uh, on the rooftop or around the building or um, some other um, option as part of zoning requirements if it's not if it's not happening. If we know that this is something that's an important part of, of where people live and how they live uh, and the market isn't accommodating that, is it something that public policy uh, needs to address? 
Um, and then that leads, you mentioned to the, you mentioned the, uh, the nooks and crannies of existing buildings. Um, most of our housing stock is already built. Um, we only add about a million, oops. Um, I'm just going to pause. There we go. Um, so most of the housing stock uh, that our 325 million citizens live in, um, and I'm not sure what percentage of those are actually seniors, but they're, they're already built. Um, so how do we retrofit those? Where do we find the, the resources for that? And, and what does that retrofit um, look like? Um, and then I think interestingly, you know, we've been moving towards this shared economy model. Uh, obviously, everyone's familiar with rideshare. Um, in the housing market, we have um, uh, started to move towards a more um, uh, co-living or shared living um, model. Uh, COVID has obviously disrupted that. Um, outdoor spaces are clearly shared spaces. So how we navigate this um, in a way that's safe for everyone is going to require um, a lot, a lot of thoughts, uh, a lot of thinking um, around again um, rules and regulations to keep people safe and, and make sure that people trust trust the space. Um, and then, with regard to the senior population specifically, a lot of the work, Elizabeth, that you presented, I think, also applies to kind of family housing uh, and general population housing. So, although the seniors certainly do suffer disproportionately from isolation um, and, and potential uh, loneliness and depression that comes from that. Uh, and getting outside and engaging with people is an opportunity to, to overcome that. Certainly, um, you know, children um, and, and people, uh, uh, regular adults uh, also benefit from the same thing. Um, so a lot of the work uh, that you've done, I think will also be, uh, you know, applicable to the, to the work we're doing in, in, um, in affordable housing for, for just the general population as, as well as seniors. Um, I think I'm going to pause there uh, and see if we have any burning questions. So first I want to um, ask Elizabeth if anything I said uh, is strikes you as incorrect uh, based on your research, uh, disagreeable based on your opinion, or do you want to comment otherwise on any, any of those, uh, those statements? And then uh, we'll open it up to, to folks who, who may want to ask a question. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that I've been thinking about, at least specifically in your question of um, who pays for this, because it really is like the burning question of the day, like who will pay for these things, you know, um, it's really easy just to say, oh, the government will pay for it. Like that's a pretty easy catch all and it might not necessarily be correct either. Um, and what really got me thinking about this point was, um, an academic advisor of mine, I talked to her about my research and she was like, well, okay, how is this actually going to happen? Um, and I think, you know, obviously this could be a long road ahead, but with the health benefits that um, we're seeing from outdoor space and potentially in the incorporation of outdoor space into affordable housing, um, it may no longer like need to be a question of who pays but you know if if there's return on say the investment then perhaps at that point it is worth paying for um if you're noticing that you have improved health benefits like decrease in asthma or cardiovascular issues that will no longer put a strain on other governmental programs like medicare medicaid and the like that is that might just be incentive enough to get these programs rolling um, it, it, it's more of like a reallocation of funds almost um, if you're noticing that these certain health benefits are coming from the space. Um, so again, like the who pays question is a big one. And I think a lot of research, a lot of research is going to have to be done on the tangible quantifiable dollar sign health benefits. Um, but again, I think it could be a case of like reallocation of funds. Um, rather than just simply paying up or paying more. Um, so definitely something that I've been thinking about a lot too. So. Yeah, I think that we're gonna, I think you've highlighted an area where we need to see some active pilots uh, move pretty quickly to just demonstrate those savings and the natural place for um, HI and others to go are the foundations that focus on, on senior communities. I, one other comment I would make that I forgot to say before is that 
So, um, so your work was focused specifically really on, on, on affordable senior communities. So those are kind of formalized multifamily operations that serve a senior community. Um, but there are also informal senior communities such as, you know, apartment buildings that over time would just become uh, uh, what it re references NORCs or naturally occurring retirement communities. So there's, there's no official senior um, funding or limitation on them, but they've just, that's what they've become. And then as we move forward, um, the generation, the, the boomer generation, and then the Gen Xers are, are showing strong indications of wanting to age in place. So whether that's in single family or in an accessory dwelling unit um, or in an apartment building, but not, not moving into formalized communities, um, there's a whole cohort of seniors who are gonna need to be addressed in a, in a deconcentrated way, which actually may provide them more access to, to outdoor space. Um, but for those formalized communities of designated kind of senior multifamily, um, uh, multifamily properties or campuses, um, uh, we, we need to kind of figure out how to, uh, especially for those that are already built, bring those outdoors in. Um, can we uh, turn to our great audience here and see, does anyone have a question for Elizabeth and the work that she did over the last three months? Matt, I actually got a question that was okay. messaging me. So I guess I can just um, address that one first. Um, it was talking about um, a strict, pure private space housing, knowing that inhabitants, uh, dwellers have the need to go into more public space um, and basically how we can prevent the kind of potential COVID transmission in those spaces. Um, so something that I looked at in more like the multi-generational um, analysis in semi-private um, is the potential to assign space um, or assign time slots that allow for cleaning in between. So if you have a large enough space where, um, you know, you can have certain residents who are less likely to go out into um, essential jobs where they're not going to be interacting with the public as much, you can group those individuals together because they are less likely to co transmit COVID between themselves. And then where you have more essential workers, just ensuring things like proper cleaning in between use, like that's gonna be a really big thing. Um, that way it, it, it limits the cross contamination between these kind of, these two subsets essentially of um, multi-generational house, housing. Um, I, hope, I hope that answers the question to the degree that you were hoping for. Um, please let me know if you would like me to elaborate more on that one. Yeah, and we know that uh, there's a strong, um, there's been a strong movement to, to create greater alignment between senior citizens and, and children, essentially, you know, it, it, schools, because there's, there's uh, the ability, for example, to, uh, um, to, to teach seniors technology and the seniors enjoy watching the kids play. And those two groups, though, are incompatible when you think about uh, transmission of disease obviously so it's kind of that's another example of, uh, relates to what I was talking about with the shared economy where at the macro level it seems like a great idea it's a great solution but then with this new focus on um, reducing or, or eliminating transmission of disease um, it becomes much more challenging yeah and kind of with that the question ends up <laughs> being sort of like who is going to be a vector almost um, just understanding how you know, certain members of affordable housing community might interact with the public and being aware of that, obviously that becomes an issue of privacy to some degree, um, but just a general awareness of the needs of your residents, what they're, who they are likely to come in contact with and that sort of thing um, is definitely valuable information in terms of separating that kind of space. Yeah, and I think while we wait for another question to come in, if I could just say, I think this goes to the importance of, um, to the extent that we use regulation or public policy to define, to achieve an outcome, that we do it in a more descriptive way than prescriptive way so that it allows for innovation and flexibility um, because we may need to experiment a little bit and figure out how to generate that outcome. Um, and to the extent it gets written into a regulation, uh, usually if you, know, you must do it this way um, in, in terms of operationalizing it with people, uh, that that can lead to, to failure, essentially. 
Great. Sarah, you've got a question. I saw you turn your video on. People are f free to turn their video on at this point too, and you can just sort of wave to me <laughs> if you have a question. Thanks. Um, thanks, Elizabeth, for this really interesting presentation. Um, I have not attended an AHI presentation before, so uh, but I know Elizabeth from Williams. Um, so I apologize if my uh, question is not the, the typical kind of question here, but it's a, a practical question. You talked about finding nooks and crannies and making them available as green spaces and, and um, available for help. I'm wondering about uh, the potential to partner with spaces that are already being used for something else and uh, for uh, a housing community to say maybe it's um, a, a playground out of school and when the school is not in session can that somehow be adapted to be made more accessible to seniors or others who are living in the area or are there other spaces that might already be assigned a use but um, that use might be thought of more flexibly in the context of your research question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with those kinds of like outdoor spaces and not not outdoor outsider spaces um, that aren't fully already integrated into like the property at the baseline level. Um, something that I think should be considered is how proximate it is. Um, so I talked about earlier my research, um, especially this University of Michigan study shows that, you know, you, the closer the space is, the more likely seniors are to use it. Um, one actually very tangible example of this is in a um, community called 8315 East Colfax, which is in Denver, Colorado. And they have like a playground with a school literally in their courtyard. Um, and with that specifically, it is available to use when school is not in session. Um, so that's one example of you know, a super proximate space that can be used in the after hours. Um, I think there's definitely potential. I think there needs to be questions of how often is it being cleaned? Um, you know, is there a way to ensure that when seniors are using it, it is either only seniors or a certain subset of your um, residents and the like. But I think there is potential. I think it just has to be looked at. Um, critically, not only with like the proximity, but also like just the logistical cleaning and whatnot. And that's, I'll, I'll jump here. That's a very interesting question also because Elizabeth, it reminds me of where we started a lot of your discussions at the very beginning of the year, which was with a senior housing community on the edge of Williams College and right next to an outdoor space that is, a, I believe owned by the college, is that right? It's a yeah. pond and walking trails. And so some of our very early discussions were, how could the relationship between this privately owned senior community for affordable housing and Williams College that owned this great amenity that was abutting it connect or not connect and what were the implications of that? And that's sort of faded as, as you've gone into all of the other case studies, which is fine, that's what research does. Um, but nice to see that closed loop come around and maybe now that you're back in, uh, back on campus, you can think about it more and, you know, go walk around and see what it looks like. See what the opportunities are there. Munya, I saw you turn your video on. Is that a cue you had a question or a thought? <laughs> no, I ju just a very quick comment. I joined the conversation late, so I probably missed something important, but I wanted to say how pleased I am to hear that we're talking not just about the physical health of uh, the communities, but also the mental health. And I find it's a component that's missing uh, in a lot of decisions that are made right now around the world, not just for housing, but in the way COVID is dealt with. Uh, so I was very pleased to hear that. And uh, congratulations, this has been a great uh, discussion. Thank you. I'm mute. Uh, to come back to some of the questions around who pays for this, I'm wondering if there's a line of inquiry or thought to be developed about how aspects of these spaces could be built into requirements of insurance down the road. If the, if the case can be made that this is mitigating a certain number of risks, whether it's a declining health risk or an, you know, you were talking about the Medicare, Medicaid piece of it, you know, risk of people needing to go into the healthcare system at greater rates or lesser rates. Um, but also in, in the context of a pandemic or a sudden event, essentially this idea of what is your response capacity to that event and do these spaces offer a different kind of adaptability, to use an overused term, resilience to 
this kind of an event and how could that tie to some of the arguments around insurance? It's not a fully formed thought, but an opening for ideas down the road. Yeah, I'll just say quickly um, that, you know, the insurance market drives a lot. It sets the requirements for what people uh, outside of the governmental realm have to do essentially if they want to own and operate a multifamily property, especially. So that is one of the spaces that AHI is looking at pretty closely. Um, and uh, unfortunately, more requirements in insurance usually mean more expense to the multifamily owner, which means more expense passed through to the resident, which makes housing affordability more difficult. So again, one of the things that we have to balance here as a society, I think it's so challenging is that we know the outcomes we wanna generate, we kind of know the ingredients that go into baking that outcome, but it all costs money. And so there are trade-offs that we have to make. Um, you know, the argument could be made that the money is there, we, especially in the United States, we have more capital than we know what to do with, and we just don't apply it to solving social problems. But then you start to migrate into that, that area of uh, capitalism, socialism, which unfortunately there doesn't seem to be much stomach for um, in this country. But, um, but the insurance piece of it, um, it essentially becomes an unfunded mandate but it could become reality. Uh, this is the cost of doing business. We have about five minutes left. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any last thoughts you want to share, and then I'll do a little a little closer. Um, sure. I guess just overall, one of the big things that I came away with this is, um, especially in places like in an urban setting or where um, low income communities already are lacking like certain basic access to things like parks and green space. Um, something that really honed, I, I honed in on was um, the need for in, this in-house um, space, if at all possible. Um, and then kind of just overall, I'm super appreciative to AHI for taking me in and letting me do this research. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, that's my bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I did just see uh, one person raise their hand. So if you want to add your comment in, you're welcome to do so. Uh, Kazi baby from uh, Bangladesh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So we are working mainly with the poor community and those who are evicted several times and our government uh, has a policy that, that the affordable housing they will provide for the poor people. But uh, the poor community didn't get it any uh, affordable housing or any plan. Our government have no implementation. So, uh, and also, you know, the due to the COVID situation, their health condition and economic condition also uh, very low because they are not getting uh, sufficient money for and no income source. And in this way, the community people, especially the poor community, they are suffering a lot. And uh, several times they are evicted by the government people and the, uh, where is the vacant? the cash land we call it but uh, they are not getting opportunity to purchase the land because it is expensive so in this situation what you what what is your uh, uh, opinion that uh, how these poor people can get help because you know i am uh, i'm also the uh, partner of uh, world urban forum and uh, even habitat but even habitat actually not working in Bangladesh uh, for the poor people. So, uh, and also, you know, I'm the member of Hero Commission. So we are also working for the uh, grassroots women and leadership development we are doing, but still it is, uh, uh, it is not possible to provide them housing or affordable housing for mm -hmm. the poor people. So, this is uh, this is why I am asking you that what to do. 
question. A big, a big question for the last two minutes of the webinar. Um, it's, that's a that's really good question. And um, actually, our other intern, Andrea, who's going to be presenting next week, has focused her research on how particularly the health secure housing piece intersects with informal communities. She was looking in Latin America, but it applies globally as well to other conditions. Um, and to, to give a little preview, one of the things that we found, then she found, that was particularly interesting is that in doing so, this concept has to expand beyond the house itself into the neighborhood or the community, because you have a very different set of dynamics in terms of flows of people in and out of what is considered a secure area in, in this context. Um, so very complex um, and definitely worth thinking about and, and builds off of this. Um, Noah has just put the pre-registration link into the chat for next week's webinar, but we've also put it out there. Matt, did you wanna? I just wanna say one thing, not in direct response to, to Kazi, which we'll address next week, I think, but thank you for raising that, is that as important as Elizabeth's work has been on the outdoors, COVID has also revealed to us how important the indoor air quality is. Um, and we're, we're, we, we have a lot of work to do there. And the irony is that obviously the West Coast of the US right now is experiencing something where people have to be indoors and the quality of that air and the filtration of the outdoor air coming in with regard to uh, lower income people, especially, and, and the resources they have versus uh, wealthier people is, is another area of concern for AHI and, and health secure housing in general, so. Thank you, yes. Well, thank you again, Elizabeth and Matt, for your time in leading this discussion. This has been fantastic. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, for those of you who joined a little later, this is the third in a series of webinars that AHI has been doing. Um, Next week will be again focused on health secure housing, uh, particularly related to Latin America's informal settlements. Um, we welcome all of your ideas. We appreciate all of the support that we've received from folks on this call and off uh, in various ways, intellectual support, moral support, financial support. Um, AHI is a nonprofit, so we're able to do things like bring in Elizabeth for the summer as an intern. Um, based on everyone's assistance. And it's great for us, as Elizabeth has indicated, she had a fun time this summer. So I'm gonna extend that out and say it's great for the interns. Um, and uh, we appreciate all of your ideas and your help. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, you're welcome to follow up with me um, or Noah who's been sending out the announcements and we can get those to Matt and Elizabeth along the way. And we hope you enjoyed the hour.